Open the podcast bay door as hell. everyone, and welcome to episode 57 of Welcome to Geek Town. I'm your host, Kurt Onstead. I've been a proud geek all my life, being into role-playing games, board games, sci-fi, fantasy, and especially superheroes and comics. And I want to help others join me in those pursuits. But I've found that sometimes people can get overwhelmed or feel left out because they don't already have what some consider the requisite knowledge to be considered a fan. And that's where Welcome to Geek Town comes in. Here, you can ask your questions without feeling like a gatekeeper is calling you out for not yet being fully versed in every aspect of your new interest. Shout out to my patrons for this month. Returning patron Matthew Saint joins back in the group, along with continuing support from Utuk Zul, Julio Herrera, and Lyndon Onstead. Thank you all. These four will get to listen to the entire unedited version of my interview with Evan Skolnick, including our pre-interview discussion of how COVID-19 is affecting our lives, and some extra discussion of voice work directing. If you want access to this and other exclusive Welcome to Geek Town content, it's just a dollar per month to join in at patreon.com slash welcome to Geek Town, which helps me pay for the costs involved in putting on the show. I appreciate any support you can give. This week, we're concluding my interview with writer, editor, professor Evan Skolnick, who, as you have heard, has had quite a career in both comics and video games over the years. For this final portion of the interview, I solicited questions from my listeners and chose a few of those to ask, mostly focused on the gaming side of his career. Gail asked, how do they choose voice talent or cast voice talent? Do they, do you open call or do they already have someone in mind most of the time? It's usually an open call. Uh, in my experience, we, we generally don't have someone in mind, although that can vary depending on the studio. There's, there's really no, you know, one of the things about working in games is you quickly learn is that there's no standard way to make a game and everyone, every studio has its own ways of doing things. So I'm going to speak from my own experience. And on larger projects, we generally go through a, a talent agency. The writing staff, myself included, will create character sheets, maybe even cre and create with, a, with with sample dialogue lines and uh, basically send it out to the, the talent folks who then go find us people to audition. And then the audition files come back to us as, as you know, MP3s or waves or avis or whatever and we listen to them all and then we maybe narrow it down and then uh, we cast those characters so you know for example one of the things that we that we did that we were very concerned about with uh with again marvel ultimate lines 2 was we have three main characters in that in that story nick fury iron man and captain america and the guy who we wanted for captain america was also the guy we wanted for nick fury like he was doing two totally different voices and we were like, we, this is the guy for both of these characters, but what, what, what happens when they're in a scene together? Will it sound like the same person? So we were very concerned about that, but it worked out great. Whereas for a game I was, I'm working on right now uh, called uh, hero syndrome, which is not yet uh, out, but it's been announced. You know, I, I believe that the um, it's basically a one man band. I'm helping. I'm basically serving as a contract writer to help out with this game. And, the creator, I think, just went onto like voices.com and put out a call for people. So it was kind of very much very informal, but it was the same process. You know, I, I, I provided character sheets and demo lines for audition purposes. And then they, the, the, the lines came back and we kind of went through them together and, and kind of cast, the, cast, cast them based on the audition lines. Okay. Part of your answer there makes Anthony's question a, a next 
logical one, which is how much of the work in the game industry is freelance versus how much of it is shop or permanent hires? Well, again, that varies. The, the, certainly the, the big productions you see are generally done you know, in a development studio with most people being co-located. However, even in situations like that, they will often outsource certain aspects of the, of the process to either a, a, another studio or to individual freelancers. And some projects are fully remote. So uh, when I worked on Cuphead, which is a game that came out a few years ago, and maybe you've heard of it, it's like playing a, being inside a 1930s cartoon. It's crazy. My understanding is that team was almost entirely um, remote. So I never, I never met anybody on the team. Everything was done electronically and through Skype video or Zoom videos and uh, a, an interface called Basecamp, which is a browser-based project location. So um, yeah, there's, there's, every, it, there's all kinds of different approaches. It depends on the, on the scale of the game. The bigger the game, the more likely it was, it was created mainly by a, a team of people co-located in the same building with some freelance support, most likely. Sarah has a couple of questions. Actually, they come from Sarah's husband, but she wanted to know, how has the content of games progressed or changed over the years, especially in terms of the expectation of quality and story depth? Well, we're definitely seeing better and better quality on that front because studios are now beginning to understand that storytelling and writing is a skill that is a uh, specialized skill. Because like I said, when I came into games in like 2001, the, the term game writer didn't really exist back then. Like there was no role for that. That's one of the reasons I came in as a producer is because that was the closest thing I could imagine to what I had been doing before. That's changed. That's been changing since then. And now it's it's quite the opposite. It's, it's almost expected that with a game that is going to be high quality, it has a story, that you're going to have a story team. You're going to have professional storytellers in with that team or consulting with that team to get that best result. And so that's partly a reflection of you know, it's kind of like a, you know, it's it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy when, you know, you start seeing that, and then you see better produced game stories, which which creates an expectation in the audience for more of those, which requires studios to invest more in bringing in writers and narrative designers and bringing them earlier in to the process. Because like I said, sometimes the team thinks they can just handle it themselves. And then they eventually realize that it was much more challenging than they thought. And they start try to bring someone in to help. What Rihanna Pratchett, who's uh, Terry Pratchett's uh, daughter and a very prominent game writer, she calls it being a narrative paramedic, <laughs> where, which is what we often find ourselves in the case of being. We come in onto the moving train or the, the patient is down because the team thought they could, they could write at a certain level and, and at a certain point they realized they couldn't. And it's too late to really make it great. You just want to kind of make it not dead. Uh, so that's been changing. And that's why we're seeing some really great game stories coming out. And it's an entire entire landscape of new kinds of storytelling that we can do that have never been done before. That's one of the reasons I love working in games is that, you know, the things that we can, that we can do in the interactive space uh, in terms of storytelling are still being discovered and that's exciting. And so uh, I think that's part of what's driving the increased expectations and thus the increased quality. I love that narrative paramedic. That's even more of an emergency than a script doctor. Right. Yeah. It's similar, but you know, it's 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 like there's there hasn't even been a writer on the project up till then, right? Like, I mean, maybe the, des the 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 lead designer felt they could do it, they could handle it, and it just becomes apparent in many cases that it's actually not as easy as it looks because most people think they can write, most people think they're experts on story until they try to sit down and do it, and then they usually find that there's more to it than they realized, and that's the case in games as well. But that, like I said, that is changing uh, slowly. Yeah, I I know storytelling is is not my forte this podcast is very fact based and so i try to put the facts into a narrative story but actually coming up with with plots and dialogue i have the utmost respect for writers for being able to do that what's well, always good to hear i mean i love to hear when a creative director says that that's always a good sign when they when they recognize that it's not something that everyone can do and that you want someone in there who's been through the cycle many times because another prominent game writer who I'm acquainted with, Susan O'Connor, said that, you know, experienced writers can kind of see around corners. Hmm. They can quickly evaluate a narrative idea 
and and kind of, kind of follow it through to its logical possibility space very quickly because they've been through it so many times. Whereas a team who hasn't done that may waste time chasing down avenues that a writer would quickly identify as, as being dead ends. So I always like that quote too, that, that writers can kind of see around corners. Experienced writers can see around corners. Yeah, that's a, a nice way of putting it. Uh, let me move on to my next listener question here. Sean wants to know, how often do you find yourself writing complex story arcs for your players that you know that they're un- unlikely to run across? Uh, okay. Well, that's the, that's the the problem with branching, right? Is that, you know, you give a player a choice, go left or go right. And uh, if they if that branch never folds back on itself, then yeah, you you and the team are talking about creating a bunch of content that maybe half your players aren't going to see. And so it's one of the reasons why we ought, we don't often see games that branch very much. If they do, they often fold back to a unified front. And that's what we did in Marvel Ultimate Alliance 2. It's what we did in most of the, of the Telltale series that I was involved in is because you just simply can't keep expanding and expanding because it's, ex, it's exponential growth and the audience is seeing less and less of what you actually created every time you do that. Yeah. Unless they go back and, and replay it, which most players do not do. So, yeah, you've got to be really careful when you do that. And what we, what we often try to create is not necessarily choice, but the illusion of choice. And what that means is the player feels like they're making a choice that affects the world. And it does feel that way. But if you looked under the hood, you'd realize in the end, everyone's going to go back to the same spot, no matter what they chose. But you don't know that when you play it because you don't see the other possibilities. Mm-hmm. And so we try to make the player feel like they've got that choice but it's really kind of smoke and mirrors a lot of the time because like this person very astutely pointed out, branching and continuing to branch makes for the team focusing a lot of effort on things that the player will never see, which gives them less time to work on things the player will see. Right. Yeah. So Forrest wanted to know, how often is the story held back by the limitations of the game, either the technology itself or like a publication deadline? And do those dropped stories or dropped branches ever get put back in as DLC or are they usually kind of gone forever? Um, you build a you build a game knowing that most of the things you want to put in are not going to get in. That, that goes for design. That goes for a lot of things. And it also goes for the story. And so when you build a game story and you're often building it around an existing design concept, you hopefully build it in a way where it's designed to withstand being cut down. And having things cut, like if you're writing basically a linear story, which a lot of game stories actually are, if they cut like mission three and you had some important story beats happening in mission three, you've got to find a way to have it either not happen at all or shoehorn it into mission two and four. There was a cut scene in Marvel Ultimate Lines 2 with Nick Fury's kind of like fighting for his life in the uh, negative zone prison uh, as it's on self-detonation. And it, it, it ended up being cut. And so we turned it into an audio object, uh, an audio log. So it was almost the same script, but you you would just hear what happened. He was basically leaving a leaving a recording of what happened, and you can hear him fighting and shooting and, and getting captured, or maybe getting captured. Uh, but we didn't have to animate anything, so we found a way to deal with the fact that that cutscene simply could not be produced. We were, we were running out of budget and time. So yeah, you um, you're often constrained by many things in the game, especially the thing that is most important to understand as a game writer is, you know, you've, you, I'm sure you've heard the term, uh, you know, show, don't tell. Oh, definitely. Right. Yeah. You know, from movies uh, and also comics as well. But in games, we say do, don't show. And what that means is we would rather have the player be actively participating in the story rather than watching it. So if you're watching something in a cutscene, we ask ourselves, could the player be doing this instead of watching their character do it? And so um, the, the things that the player can actually do are limited, right? I mean, we can't, it's not D&D where the player can think of anything and they can just do it. It's, there's limited mechanics. So we are often constrained by, one of the first things I ask when I come on a project, especially when it's already in motion, is who is the player and what can they do? Because the more I focus the story around those things, the more the player can participate actively in the story as opposed to watching it. Oh, that that's a great way to, to start your planning process. Yeah. I mean, 
I, the word planning process is probably an exaggeration. It's more like a, you know, again, narrative paramedic, you know, the paramedic comes in and says, okay, what's the, what's the blood pressure and what's go what's wrong with him? <laughs> you know, um, it's the same kind of question though. Like what, what have you, what have you already built? What do I have to work with here? Because I don't want to be wasting time with story ideas that don't match this gameplay. Like I said, it's a very different kind of thinking than writing a comic book series. Mm -hmm. Forrest had kind of a follow-up question, specifically more about DLC. Do you ever write with the assumption that there will be DLC down the road and then and purposefully leave loose threads to tie that onto? Yes. That's a simple yes. I mean, if, if there's already a plan for DLC, then the DLC will already be in motion before the game comes out because uh, it takes so long to develop game content. So there might be, you know, as the game is, is entering its bug fixing phase, which might last four months or longer on a larger game, there's already a DLC team working hard to get, you know, DLC content, especially if it's day one DLC, right? Because then day one DLC ships the same day as the game. Right. So that's definitely part of the plan. But even DLC that comes out later, a lot of times it is already in motion before you've ever seen the main game. Because otherwise you'd be waiting two years for it and, the demand would be probably mostly gone by then. That makes sense. Yeah. So Denise, and full disclosure here, Denise is probably asking for her son, who is my nephew. Oh. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, what type of education do writers usually have for video games? Is it more technical or is it English or film or something else? Or just it, it varies so much. It varies a lot. There are very few programs like the one at Cogswell. I'm only aware of, of three or four others in the entire world where there, there are so many game design programs out there. But the number of game design programs that have an actual track of classes related to storytelling, you can count on one hand. There's one in Sweden. There's one in Vancouver, which is the Vancouver Film School. And then there's three others. There's Cogswell. There's Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, upstate New York. And there's Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. Those are the pro programs I'm aware of that have game design programs that actually have a, a, an entire writing track as well. That doesn't mean that every single game writer went to one of these schools. Far from it. A lot of times game writers, they come from other places within games or from outside the medium. So, for example, my co-writer on Star Wars 1313, Matt Mikdovitz, was a writer on the Clone Wars TV show. Hmm. And uh, I got to work with him on that. And he's one of the writers on Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, which was you know, done very well this year. And, and I'm very happy for him and the team. Uh, they did a great job. But he, he came in mainly as an animation writer. So he had broken in that way. A lot of the writers, game writers also have just come in in another role. So I came in as a producer, right? I mean, I had this other career before that as a Marvel writer and editor. But I came in as a producer and then shifted over. And I see that a lot, that designers who kind of pick up on narrative elements through their work can kind of move over to the narrative design side or the writing side. That's another track is, and again, it's, it's one that I recommend is not trying to break into the industry as a game writer because it's just so competitive uh, and it's such a specialized role, but more to try to get your foot in the door with a studio in another more common role like producer or artist or designer or even QA and then let them know, hey, I'm interested in the story. I've studied some story and I want to be part of that. I can. And a good studio will let you begin to be involved in that process, hopefully, and then eventually move your way up. I've seen that, I've, I've seen that many times. But if they're in the San Francisco Bay Area, they should definitely come uh, to Cogswell. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> or if they're willing to move out. He's currently uh, still in school in Southern California, so it's a little ways away for, oh, okay. from, for him. Okay. Well, put a pin in it for a few years down the line. <laughs> But in the meantime, you know, there's nothing stopping someone like that from, from making their own games now. There, there's never been a better time to just make your own story games. You've got all kinds of great tools out there. You've got Twine. You've got RenPy. You've got uh, Episode, which is a, a handheld game system, uh, a, a, mo a mobile game that you can uh, go online on their uh, app on the computer and make your own visual games. So there's no reason to wait to college to start making your own simple storytelling games that don't require programming knowledge. Hmm. That's good to know. That's good information. Cool. Thanks. So i uh, going to end on kind of a silly note here. And this one you can pull from either from gaming or from your editorial days. 
but Jeffrey wants to know what's the stupidest concept you ever had to shoot down. Oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. The stupidest concept I ever had to shoot or down. Or maybe the wow. silliest. I I don't I don't know that any of those really jumped out at me. I mean, the stupidest things I had to deal with were things I mentioned earlier, which is the license the licensing side of things. That's that's where I've kind of encountered the most ridiculous things in my career, I think, is is on the license side of material, especially when the licensor doesn't trust you yet and is just trying to protect their job. You know, can can Robocop not shoot anybody? Can you not have have his gun? Can you not have time travel in the Terminator series you're doing? And can you make it more like a cartoon show? Instead of drawing Barbie in these different expressions, can you just take the five images from the style guide and just keep using those in all your panels? These are things I sh- are not things I shot down, but certainly things that you just make you shake your head and go, "What? What am I doing? What is going on here? What? What choices did I make that led me to this moment?" But yeah, I, I don't. I can't think of any creator ideas that came to me that I that I thought were really stupid. I, I think maybe I've been lucky enough to work with really smart creative people. And one of the things that we said at Marvel, actually, it's, it's actually a good segue into this, and it's kind of stuck with me. And uh, the, the phrase was, there are no bad ideas, just bad writers. You know, what that meant was that it really came down to execution. An idea that sounds horrible in the hands of, you know, an Alan Moore, for example, you could throw any idea at Alan Moore, I bet, and he could make it really cool if you give him some latitude, some wiggle room, right? And you could give, you could hand a fantastic idea to a subpar writer, and they're almost sure to screw it up, right? So... I don't really necessarily focus on bad ideas because the, it's more a question of execution and the person who's going to execute on those ideas. Because on the surface, almost anything can, can sound stupid. It doesn't mean it is. So I try to be open-minded about that and really focus on, well, okay, well, how, what do you mean by that? How would you actually play this out? A good, a good writer will, will have an answer for that and, and may surprise you. So again, uh, take a stupid idea and put it in the hands of a, of a great writer and I, I bet they'll spin gold. Uh, That's a great attitude to have. Uh, That's very open-minded. So thank you so much. Absolutely. This is a lot of fun. That concludes my interview with Evan Skolnick. If you enjoyed this format, let me know and tell me who else you'd be interested in hearing me talk to. Or if you have any questions for a regular episode of the show, I'd love to hear from you as well. Either way, go ahead and send me an email at welcome to geektown, all spelled out, at gmail.com. Or you can go to www.welcome to, the number two in this case, geektown.com and click submit a question if you'd prefer to remain anonymous. Other contact options include facebook.com slash welcome to geektown or twitter at geektown podcast. Also, If you'd like to support the show directly, come join the Patreon at patreon.com slash welcome to geektown for just a dollar per month to get access to full scripts of the show, outtakes, and a monthly shout out. You can also help the show grow by subscribing and giving a five star review over on Apple Podcasts to join the Geektown City Council, which helps other people find the show so we can all tell them Welcome to Geektown, population us. Welcome to Geek Town is written, narrated, edited, and produced by me, Kurt Onstead. Theme music is by Aaron Lovitz, logo art by Archie Santana. All other sound clips are the copyrighted material of their respective owners, and no infringement is intended, falling under fair use. Welcome to Geek Town.